Good morning, good morning. Let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. We get to look at your word and you can help us to see uh, something that will help us today and that we can uh, give you all the praise and thanks for all that you do. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. I've been in the chapter 16 of Luke. And I named, named this one the dishonest manager. Very interesting story. It's kind of like uh, it's it's, a, it's it's almost a story told in the negative to get us to understand uh, what we're not supposed to be. Uh, but that this man was being very typical of uh, the way the world is. And the world loves its own. So that uh, Jesus is basically saying here that because the world loves its own, uh, he basically was getting away with it because he was doing something that was typical of someone who uh, was worldly. Uh, it's kind of interesting that the uh, the manager in this actually uh, says to the dishonest employee that uh, uh, he was pretty impressed with what he did uh, because that's how he got uh, uh, that's how he was able to make his riches. So uh, he could appreciate uh, what he did to try to uh, prepare himself for the future. Very fascinating story. So well, let's get let's get into it. Got a different picture today. And so we'll just get, jump right into verses. Uh, well, in Luke 16, we're gonna try to go through uh, to verse 13 for this particular part of it. This is the famous chapter two when we get into, and you can see in this picture over on the right hand side, uh, we get into the story of uh, Lazarus and the uh, 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 telling the story of, uh, trying to think of Lazarus and the, uh, the the rich man. And so uh, that's later on in the chapter. So that's basically over this side. Well, today we're kind of on this side over here. <clears throat> But basically we have a crook who got caught. And now while he, he has time to prepare for his being fired, makes friends with some of the debitors of his, of his lords, his boss's company. So he's, gonna, he's going to uh, try to make it easier for him to move on to someplace else. So I'm gonna read through it first and we'll just kind of look at a few things. <laughs> So I'll start in verse one. And he said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man, which had a steward. And the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. In our day and time, it's better known as embezzlement. And he called him and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. If I basically, if I, if I don't like what I see, uh, yeah, your days are numbered. And the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship I cannot dig to beg, I am ashamed. So, this is somebody that really enjoys being rich. He doesn't want to have to go and uh, have to do manual labor or anything along that lines. Verse 4 I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. So basically he's going to let him pay it off for a half of what he owes. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, take thy bill and write four score. Four score is 80. Don't know why he didn't cut it in half, but uh, that's uh, doesn't really stay in this particular story. Maybe he didn't like that guy as much as the other guy. So, and the Lord commended the young. So this is the funny part. Verse eight here. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. 
For the children of the world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So that's basically our story. So let's take a look at some of this stuff. <clears throat> Verse 1 here. And he said unto the, also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. I kind of see this one as a, in a similar format to the prodigal son, but the big difference here is the prodigal son realized his mistake and was repentant and went back to his father. This steward doesn't. You know, he wants to continue being a, a crook. And we must always realize, too, that man is basically sinful. Uh, but with Christ in us, we have his righteousness to help us. Uh, but, it, but without him, that we, can, we can't, uh, we're just as bad as this guy. And so that's what Jesus is making a contrast here, kind of. Uh, what you are without him uh, is that uh, you're just basically a sinful crook. And uh, some uh, verses that, that kind of help with this particular uh, thought process over in Proverbs 18.9. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. James, the half brother of Jesus, says in uh, verse four, uh, chapter four, verse three, "Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that he ye may consume it upon your lusts." <clears throat> so jumping down, but I'm going to verse three. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig and beg. I am ashamed. Uh, and basically, he, uh, he's, not, he's not somebody that's going to be flipping burgers at McDonald's. Uh, that wasn't. Uh, so he's going to try to figure out a way that once he gets let go from this company, that he basically has a job somewhere else. So he's going to kind of prime the, uh, grease the wheel, as they say. And these debitors that owe his, his current job, his current boss, money, uh, he's going to let them off the hook for less than uh, uh, what they owe. So basically, he had a lot of power in this company, and he's doing this even, even though he knows that uh, his, his days are numbered. <clears throat> so we see this also in Proverbs 24. Solomon sure was a wise man. He, he thought of a Proverbs for almost everything. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold, therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. So he doesn't want to work for what he gets, he just wants to get it. Okay, back to Luke 16, 4. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into thy houses. So this is the, this is the ultimate goal. He wants to uh, set up his next job. Basically, he's, he's making friends with those he knows he's going to uh, see uh, need need in the future. First, verse five. So he called every one of his lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, "How much owest thou, my lord?" And he said, "A hundred measure of oil." And he said unto him, "Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. And we see that uh, written here. <laughs> Barrel of oil with fifty in it. And you see he's writing a bill over here. To make it all legal and everything. Verse 7. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measure of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score. So we got that represented over here. And you see, he's making all kinds of friends. Uh, verse 8. <laughs> And the Lord commended the unjust to it, because he had done wisely, for the children of the world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. So basically, he knows how this works. He, uh, he basically, uh, this particular unjust steward, doesn't really care as long as he's taken care of. 
thinks about himself. Uh, kind of reminds me of a. Uh, if you've ever heard stories about the uh, famous loan sharks, uh, that uh, uh, that if you didn't pay them back, they would come and basically uh, hurt you very badly. And it, uh, <clears throat> so you get yourself into these kind of binds, and sooner or later you're going to end up at uh, being. Uh, I think it, it, uh, there's a term I uh, uh, once used: something to deceive. And uh, it, it's going to end up becoming your downfall. Basically, money is the root of all evil. I might want to point out in this particular verse, 2 and verse 8, when it says Lord, uh, Lord can mean anybody that's in the power of uh, a position of power. And this Lord is actually the boss of this company. It's not nothing to do with G, uh, our, our Lord, Jesus Christ. So he's proud of this guy kind of uh, in a weird way because he knew that what he did is something that he also did in the past to get to where he was. And so you can see that uh, uh, that he is similar, even though he's probably going to fire him, uh, that uh, uh, he's using similar techniques to get, uh, to get ahead in the world. <clears throat> And some verses that kind of uh, helps us. But what will be the ultimate result is what, I, what my thought is. And over in 1 Corinthians 3.18, Paul here. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. So that uh, basically uh, he thinks he's getting away with this. That uh, he's going to ultimately get away with it. But sooner or later that uh, uh, things usually uh, end up coming around for the, in you end up paying for it in the end. Also in Philippians 3, 17 through 19. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk. So as you have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is their shame, whom who mind earthly things. So again, this whole parable is, is a contrast. Jesus is telling it to say, this is ultimately what happens when you follow the world. Uh, that uh, you, may, you may be successful for a while, uh, but that uh, ultimately you won't make it into heaven. Uh, and that, uh, and that your time, you may have an enjoyable life here, but uh, it's not gonna carry through to heaven. <clears throat> Okay, back to Luke 16, 9. And I say unto you, make to yourself friends of the mammon of right and righteousness. Notice he says, friends of the mammon of, un of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. So maybe if somebody sees how shrewd and cunning you are, they may keep a close eye on you, but they like your, your style. Uh, and so they're going to hire you just based on that, that you're willing to cut corners, you're willing to cheat people. Kind of reminds me of a, you know, you know the the, uh, the the famous uh, used car salesman that uh, gets the car barely running and, and pawns it off on somebody before it uh, it breaks down again. Crude business techniques. So some interesting verses that help us with this one over in First Timothy six nine and ten. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and to many foolish and hurtful lusts which drow men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some of it after they have erred from the faith and perceived themselves through with many sorrows, sooner or later it's going to catch up with them. Maybe not now, maybe not even in this life, but uh, in a future life uh, when they realize that uh, they're going to spend eternity someplace in the latter part of this picture. And jumping down to verse 17, of 1 Timothy 6. Charge them that they are rich in the world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us riches, all things to enjoy. Now, set your size, uh, put your treasure in heaven, uh, where uh, moth, and uh, I'm going to show you that verse here in a minute. But that basically, uh, get ready for your future life uh, instead of this, this current one. <clears throat> Also, John 13, I mean, 12, 6. 
Then he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Uh, this is a comment made about uh, Judas uh, and uh, the fact that they were wasting some oil on Jesus. And of course, he was a thief also. I, I, I sometimes think a lot about Judas uh, as somebody that followed Christ for three years and ultimately uh, was, uh, uh, was not a Christian. And so it, it begs the, the, the idea that you could definitely, there are people out there that will fake it. Uh, they, they look like they're Christian. They act like they're Christian. They all say all the right things. Uh, but in, in the end, they haven't really accepted the Lord Jesus or are following him. So to where Jesus kind of comments about things like wolves in sheep's clothing. People that you think are your friend, be careful. Uh, sometimes that uh, may not necessarily be true. <laughs> I'd hate to think that that's true and that ultimately God knows. And that's the important thing is that uh, I think we have to, we have to somewhat trust, but, but, but be on guard also. Also John 13 too. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. That's an important verse from the standpoint that, uh, that Judas Iscariot was not truly uh, uh, a believer of Christ because uh, true believers would never be allowed, Satan would never be allowed to indwell them, I don't believe. Because uh, there's, there's an old saying, you know, if the Holy Spirit is in you, now realize at this point the Holy Spirit wasn't in, in any of them. But that uh, once he's in you, that uh, no other spirit can be in there. <clears throat> Jumping down to verse 27 of John 3, 13. And after the sop, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest do quickly. But Jesus knew exactly who he was, but, uh, uh, but that basically that uh, once a thief and that uh, the, his ultimate uh, ambition was to, uh, was to take the money, uh, but he realized his mistake later on. It was uh, too late. He hung himself, which I often wondered if he would have, if he, uh, he should have been able to repent also, even after the fact. Also over in Matthew 27, three through five. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. He actually brought the money back because he felt guilty about it. But saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now, I often wondered if he, if he would have repented to the Lord, if he could have saved his soul. Uh, tough situation, but uh, that's why uh, suicide is always a, uh, is, a, is the end of usually something that can, that can be taken care of. And particularly if you're a Christian, I think it's important to, to, to lay that on the Lord and that uh, he'll help you through it. But uh, there's no turning back from self-murder as what... Uh, I've heard people say that uh, they believe that you can be re you can you can be repented from uh, suicide, but if you if you're dead, how do you repent? So, still not. A, I still believe that, uh, <clears throat> that through the Lord, everything is possible. Okay, back to Luke 16, verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in least is also unjust also in much. Some verses that help with this over in Luke 19, 17, jumping ahead a little bit here. And he said unto him, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over 10 cities. Right, so this is uh, talking about another parable that Jesus teaches <laughs> that uh, when you when you receive the things that the Lord has given you and you do well with them and uh, use them appropriately, uh, that he'll uh, he sees your faith and will give you and will multiply your authority. That's the proper way. Uh, that's the way of uh, putting things uh, ahead in heaven, laying the treasures in heaven. That was from Matthew 25, 21. His Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we all want to hear the day we arrived in heaven. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter in, thou into the joy of the Lord. <laughs> As we all hope to hear when we get to heaven. 
And that's how you lay up treasure in heaven, is that you, whatever whatever Jesus tells you to do, whatever, whatever Jesus has in mind for you to do, whether it's, it doesn't really matter what it is, uh, whether it's teaching Sunday school or maybe uh, even uh, taking care of uh, cleaning up the, uh, 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 the sanctuary or uh, helping out with the, uh, the outside, taking the trash out. Whatever you feel the Lord leads you to do, if you do that, then he's faithful and that uh, he will, you're laying up treasure in heaven that way. Now, don't get me wrong uh, that first is salvation. That's guaranteed. That's bought and paid for. You're saved. You're going to heaven. This is on top of that. That's the first step uh, that uh, we don't teach. <clears throat> and I don't see it's biblical that uh, works will get you into heaven. You can be the greatest person in the world. That's not going to get you into heaven. But I truly believe that once you're a child of God and you've accepted him and the Holy Spirit is indwelling you, that you can't help but want to help. Uh, it's, it's just something you feel joy about, you feel happy about. Also in Hebrews 3.2, these are all the great verses talking about uh, laying up treasure in heaven. Who is faithful to him that appointed him as as also Moses, who was faithful in all his house. James 2, 5. Hearken, my brother, brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of the world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Revelation 3, 18. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. <clears throat> White raiment, uh, whenever it's talked about in the Bible, is always talking about righteousness. <clears throat> and the richness we're talking about here is a richness that uh, only God can give you. That they may be, that you may be uh, clothed and that the shame of the nakedness do not appear. And anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou may see. Okay, on the, back to Luke 16, 11. Therefore, you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you to trust with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is, is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? So in other words, uh, Jesus is saying here, if you're not really faithful uh, in your business dealings uh, as, a, as a Christian, then you're also representing uh, that, uh, that God will be faithful to be able to trust you to uh, with riches uh, that he's going to provide for you. And so that... Uh, one one goes along with the other. Also Luke ten forty two, but one thing is needful, and Mary had chosen the good part, which she which shall not be taken away from her. That was a situation where Mary uh, was uh, uh, Martha was working real hard to to make dinner or do stuff around stuff around the house, and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet asking questions, and that was a comment to Jesus. And what's symbolic there is that Jesus said she was doing a good thing. And she was seeking him, seeking his wisdom. That like Jesus at that point was not going to be around forever. <clears throat> Can't wait to meet him in person. Colossians 3, 3 and 3, 4. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Amen. 1 Peter 1, 4 and 5. To an inheritance incorruptible and defiled, and fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So, oh, verse 13. So, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. That's what mammon means. And I really believe this is a this is a story that, again, to show the point Jesus talked about and how the world loves its own. And we see that comment over in John 15, 18, and 19. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. <clears throat> if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Now, unfortunately, that's the way it is, is it? Uh, it'll seem like people who are wicked and evil are successful and maybe more successful than we are. Uh, but that uh, we do have a father in heaven that makes sure we're taken care of. Yeah, we may not have the rich house and the uh, 
luxury vehicles and uh, and all the all the luxury items, you know, yachts and whatever. But for really, this life is so short in comparison to eternity. Set your sights on heaven, and it, uh, set your glory there, and and the Lord will take care of you. I'll throw in John 2.15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If the, any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So another thing this, uh, this story kind of reminds me of, too, is a, uh, the story of uh, Haman of Esther. Uh, that uh, uh, He basically was trying to do something similar. He used, he used the power of his boss, uh, to, uh, the king in that situation to try to uh, eliminate uh, his enemies and, and uh, basically the Jews, not, not realizing that God had a plan and put Esther in the right place at the right time to foil his uh, plans. And so that's what made me think about uh, Esther in this scenario, because she foiled the plans of uh, Haman in that story. And here, uh, somehow the, the, uh, the unjust steward, the steward got caught by his boss also and ended up uh, being fired. <clears throat> I guess the, uh, the moral of this story is be careful who you make friendships with in this cutthroat world. Uh, money lovers don't respect people above money. Uh, that's definitely true. And I think that's what uh, this painting is kind of representing here. <clears throat> you need to, I think that what, the, what it's saying right here is that this man, is, uh, his, his love of money is gonna eat him alive. Uh, and that uh, you have two choices. You go either can go head towards mammon or head towards love of money, which is over here on the side of the picture, or head for the kingdom of God. Uh, you can't do both. <clears throat> and this man, and, and, and just like, and, and unlike the prodigal son who uh, realized his error and uh, turned his ways around and went back to his father and, and asked for repentance. This man did not. He just wanted to continue doing what he was doing. And the funny thing about money is once it runs out, and that's not, now is the message we heard from the prodigal son, is that uh, the prodigal son went out and had a had a good old time, and I'm sure he had lots of friends. And it makes a comment. Let me just refresh our memory a little bit on that. Over in Luke 15, 13, here we see where, where the, uh, the prodigal son ended up. And not many days after, the youngest son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And they wasted its substance with riotous living. And we found out what kind in verse 30. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, in other words, uh, basically uh, seeking women and, and the partying and sex and that kind of stuff, that was killed for him the fatted calf. But going back to verse 15, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of the country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And so that, uh, well, the bet that uh, all those friends and uh, harlots and uh, whoever he was spending money with and on uh, were nowhere to be found once the money ran out. And that's, that's very typical. I think that most of us have probably been, been in one of those situations at least once in their life. I know I have. <laughs> Not with harlots, but... Uh, uh, where it seems like when you got money, all of a sudden your your, your friends multiply. As soon as you uh, you don't have any money anymore, all of a sudden don't have many friends. And those ain't the kind of friends you want to really try to try for. So to end on a positive note, uh, lay up your treasure in heaven. Or and the famous verse for that is Matthew six nineteen through twenty one. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up your treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so if your heart is in heaven, that's where your treasure is being stored, and, and the Lord knows that and sees it. So that uh, so we can see here, we, I pretty much pointed to the parts of the picture we talked about today. And I think this center section is just basically showing us that uh, 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 the idea behind the clock is, is, is that uh, time is running out and that uh, 
we got to make uh, make the right kind of decisions. We can see here this man is holding. Uh, looks like he's got money there. And this little clock down here shows 12 o'clock. Well, this one shows 1 o'clock. And so I'm thinking that uh, he realizes his time is short. And so he has to do whatever he can to make, uh, uh, make things better for himself in the future. So that's all I have for today. Let's have a little prayer. Thank you, Lord, so much for this word that you gave us in this, in this truth we, for us to help and understand your word, that we can uh, go and uh, make, make uh, decisions based on what we know about you and to follow you in prayer and, uh, and, to, and to seek guidance from you. And that uh, never, go long, or never go wrong if we do that. I praise you and I thank you so much for all you've done for me. And that uh, you be with everyone today and, uh, and help everybody with their uh, daily tasks. And uh, think about Chuck today as he's going to get some uh, uh, a doctor's appointment that you be uh, with him. And that you be with the doctors to help uh, to understand how to best treat uh, his, uh, his thumb. And we thank you, Lord, for, uh, for uh, all those out there today who are going to about their way, keep them safe. And we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, I will talk to you again tomorrow. Hope you have a great day.